Hi, this is Carrie Brownstein. This is DJ Premier. This is Darren Aronofsky. You got the Rizzo right here. Rose McGowan. Right here. Hey. Taisha Tyler. The Tribe Called Quest. Fred Armisen. Fritz Paul. Javier Munoz. Seth Meyers. Frankie Cosmos. Flying Lotus. Hi, we're Haim, and you're listening to the Talk House Podcast. Ow! Hello, and welcome to the Talk House Podcast. I'm Josh Modell. On this week's episode, we've got a great chat between two guys who'd never met before. Steve Marion, a.k.a. Delicate Steve, and the one and only Reggie Watts. Now, Delicate Steve is one of those monikers that describes both a person and a band, though Steve Marion has been the only constant member over the past 15 years or so. His music is largely instrumental, but you don't miss the singing, since his intricate, emotional guitar lines tend to do the work that a vocalist might otherwise do. His latest album is cheekily titled Delicate Steve Sings, and it's a nod to records like Willie Nelson's Stardust, mixing original compositions with covers and putting Delicate Steve's inimitable guitar tone atop them all. Check out a little bit of I'll Be There from Delicate Steve Sings. The career of today's other guest, Reggie Watts, can be tough to describe. He's part musician, part comedian, I guess, but that doesn't begin to cover what it's like to see his performances, which can include jokes, beatboxing, a variety of sampled sounds, and lots of improvisations, songs, jokes, what have you. You may have seen Watts in his most mainstream role over the past decade as the announcer slash band leader for The Late Late Show with James Corden, where he was able to inject some spontaneity and weirdness into the late night talk show genre. His latest special is called Nevermind, and it seeks to warp the comedic space-time continuum. I won't spoil it by saying any more than that. This chat starts with Delicate Steve talking about a mind-blowing Reggie Watts performance that he saw recently, and heads into conversation about busting out of genre constraints, finding the brilliance in even the most popular pop, the Kanye West-Delicate Steve collaboration that was then wasn't, and how there's no substitute for sincerity. Enjoy. Reggie, what's going on? It's an honor to talk with you. Oh, thanks. You are like Jimi Hendrix to me, <laughs> and I'm I, I'm kind of serious. I saw you perform like January of this year outside in um, the Elysian Park oh. in L.A. You mean for the Music Under a Tree show? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, that was amazing. I'd been wanting to do that for a long time, so I was like super stoked. I remember your performance so well. It was just like. I, and little bits are coming back to me now, but I, I was with my friend and we've been there all day and, you know, watching everybody, listening to everybody. It's more of a, to me at least, social event. It's nice to yeah. be out and see everybody and hear some music. And what you elicited in me is my favorite feeling when I go to see something, even though I knew what you did, I had never seen it in person before, but just this feeling of like, uh, what? what is this? Like not knowing and continually not knowing what's going to happen next and just kind of surfing, hovering and playing in that moment with, you know, just trying to be conscious and bring up Jimi Hendrix because I'm like, I don't know what that must have actually been like, you know, to hear that kind of like feedback guitar and, you know, he's following like, you know, dive bombing the sound of it and playing with it in real time, stretching out notes and, a person watching that must have actually felt who, who may or may not have been a fan in the sixties. Yeah. So you're, you're, you're like Jimi Hendrix to me. Oh, wow. You're amazing. Yeah, you're amazing. You, you really are. And I'm happy to be talking with you today. Um, I don't know what we're going to talk about, but I wanted to start there. <laughs> That's really sweet. Thank you. I've been jamming a lot lately and it's been really fun to, yeah, to just play music for fun. You know, maybe it's used for something, but, you know, it's mostly just to do it. And you do that, like, solo, just jamming by yourself? I'm jamming with other people, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. So, like, in the studio or, you know, yeah. And it's been really nice. It's it's cool to play with other people and to remember, you know, things and to also remember why you do what you do. Yeah. The fact that you can sort of tap into what you do live just with yourself is amazing to me because... I also love to improvise and sort of get to that place in my own creative process where I don't know what's going to happen next. Even if it's a song I've played a thousand times, kind of phrasing it 
differently in the moment because of what it sounds like in that room with those people that I'm playing with. Um, I can't do that by myself, except for when I'm sort of like recording my music and mixing and then tracking another part over and mixing. I can sort of play with myself like uh, and get <clears throat> to that creative place in that way. But otherwise, like I feel like I can't really pick up a, a guitar anymore and just play in the way that I imagine you could probably still do with like your your rig. Is that right? Uh, yeah. I don't know about you not being able to play, but I, it all depends on like what you want to do. You know, that's the cool thing about music. It's like, if you, I think sometimes I can definitely compare myself to somebody and being like, oh man, you know, why, you know, or I couldn't do that or something like that. But then I just realized like, well, that if I, if I wanted to be doing that, I would be doing that, <laughs> you know, like in a way. And I like to perform in front of people. I mean, yes, it's also good to, make a living but it primarily you know the energy in the room and like what does it feel like i want to give to people so that kind of gives me the energy to want to do that you know and to keep doing that or try different exploring different ways to do that too are you ever thinking about what you want the audience to think about or feel when they're seeing you play or is it more just like this is what i want to give them and that's as far as i go thinking about it I don't think too much about it other than as soon as I get on stage, hopefully I'll hear something, you know, or an idea will come into my head and that'll kind of start things off. And then it's just kind of listening real time to the room and getting a feel for whatever it is throughout the show and then ending the show in some way. Mm, I'm thinking like a parts coming back where you were talking to like the sound person, you know, the sort of like an imaginary sound person in like a German accent. Uh -huh. And it was, it was just really fun. I mean, I was watching all these people <laughs> kind of like, I'd say a percentage of the crowd was sort of like just rocking their heads and sort of digging it as though this wasn't the most unbelievable. Like it was like they were loving it, but it wasn't this uh, mind expanding. Like what is, what, what, what is he? And he, well, he was just doing that. They were just sort of uh, enjoying it. And that was, I was kind of like in disbelief about that, just looking around the audience, because for me, it was like, just like hands down the most incredible, like, it's like, I need this. I don't need a song. <laughs> All of my favorite artists and performers, even though they are a thing or a genre or, a you know, they're getting out of it, like in some way and existing above it. Some of them using a genre, like in a very sort of grounded way, but the song might just totally escape that. I mean, that's also part of the other part of the equation. You know, it's making music that you want to hear. Everything you just described is exactly what I love about music in general. And that can even be within a genre, you know, mm -hmm. like within a genre, music can do exactly what you just said about kind of existing outside of itself. And that's like my favorite music. You know, like if I listen to, I think it's called Number One by Charlie XCX, that track is like outside of its genre. Like it, there's, there's something about it to me anyways, but like it, there's something about it that I absolutely love on every single level. Like when that hook drops, I'm like, that is a perfect alignment of all the things, all levels of music that I enjoy. And also not it, not necessarily being arbitrary or kind of hidden in the shadows that it's a, it's a popular song. And then it also hits the part where a popular song and again, this is my own personal take on it, but like a popular song that ignites my imagination and wants me to immediately jump out of my chair and want to start moving. But it's also pop. Well, and it's also popular, which is great because so I'm feeling that, but it's popular. So there's more people that can feel that, which means that there's more room for that kind of music to emerge in the popular space and obviously in the popular space there are more resources hopefully if people don't have terrible deals but there's more room for that because there's a ton of it on the underground it's a very rich fertile underground electronic music scene and that's when like a sensible artist with talent and taste links up with someone sick from the edm underground or they themselves come from it i'm not i'm not excluding that but like when people pair up and they're like i'm going to preserve the integrity of this and i'm going to marry it with this easier communicator aspect. I'm like, I have a doorway and you have like a fertile world and we're going to like combine. And I think for me, exactly what you said, that's what I'm looking for. I'm, I'm looking for yeah. 
whatever, even if it's like crazy out shit, like just minimal field recording based, like reset, resampled, hyper experimental, like just one tone, barely audible in the background for like 45 minutes, who knows, whatever. But like all of that is what I'm looking for. That's, that's, that's so cool that you put that into words. Yeah. I think somebody put it into words about a band that I liked and I sort of, or it might've been like the kinks or something <clears throat> that, that's, it's always stuck with me. And for a band like that, as an example, you know, they're, the lyrics are one thing, you know, about a pleasant day, you know, but it's got a political slant to it, but it's sung with a smile, makes <laughs> you feel warm. It's just not one dimensional. And so things like that, I think elicit that feeling. And I feel like we're in a time where it's hard to cultivate like the space for imagination is so tiny because we have so many of these other competing things just for that little noggin of brain space left. I mean, music as a cultural indicator and, you know, at its best, a cultural beacon or even just an outside, a healthy outside perspective, you know, reflection of what's going on. Like that's incredibly powerful. I mean, it's a, it's a cool opportunity, but as we know, like sometimes music is just like maybe a track is just good for dancing. Yeah. Yeah. And that's all it does. Totally. But dancing triggers a really cool, positive mind space. And that is open for a furtive idea, you know? So I feel so good when an artist like chapel emerge that have a positive message, you know, that of, of, of inclusiveness without it feeling like what that word feels like when you hear it. I want us all to be having fun. I want us all to like be able to hang out together and have fun and dance together. And that to me is like, that's hyper subversive. Wow, that's cool. I've never thought of it like that, but it makes the whole concept seem more interesting to me. I think artists that play into that and sort of sneak things in, but it's so hard. I mean, I feel like it's just weird too. I don't think we can, it's not like it needs to be appreciated or called out, you know, like because that's the opposite of what it is. It's, kind of sneaking in or sneaking something in. I did a dance music festival called Houghton in the UK, and it's just pure magic. You know, it was created by Craig Richards and his partner, Amanda, who wanted to create a festival for people that didn't like going to festivals. And Craig Richards being part of what made Fabric exist and be itself the club in London from the mid 90s onwards. That was like so just absolutely crucial for modern EDM in many ways, or at least like the merger of clubs and EDM or whatever you want to call it, just good electronic based music, whatever, whatever. But, uh, you know, and so they made this festival and, and it's a quality, no corporate sponsors. All the artists are like the coolest, sickest underground to like mid ground awareness, electronic music producers and uh, them having me there and like, uh, treating me as well as they did gave me just huge hope for humanity. And I think people that go to festivals like that, they love it just as much. Like they have that perspective as well. They're like, this is where I go to remind myself who I am and who other human beings are. And then I, I can at least run on that for a while. <laughs> you know, I can't help. I'm so salty. I'm like, I start to think of the yeah, opposite side where I'm like, uh, well, when you get a when I've been to a festival and there's all the same kind of you know genre of things, then it you know you kind of you kind of see everyone's drinking this Kool Aid of this style of whatever it is, mm -hmm. if it's folk or EDM or. But then there'll always be one artist there that you know I'm again I'm sort of like what is this? And mm -hmm. also I say all these sort of salty negative takes with the you know to clarify like i've been wrong so many times and that's that's maybe my second favorite feeling is knowing that i know what's up about something if i don't like it or if i like it and then being proven wrong yeah because that feeling just rocks you and you're you know I, my some of my favorite bands of all time and artists of all time elicited this you know what is i don't this is not like this is not i don't like this and yeah. then you know, there's just this one day or one moment where you get a little light switch moment and yeah. you realize, oh, fuck, like, I'm so wrong. I'm like smiling while you're describing it because I do understand, which is you create a bunch of, it's like we all, I think we all have standards that we hold whatever it is that we're interpreting, especially in music, especially if we're musicians ourselves or involved in music in some way that we develop a relationship to it, an emotional relationship to it. I think 
that it's okay to be a little like, I don't know, man. Like, I think that that's, that's a good default. I think starting there is actually, I get it. And when some people are like, oh, are we too, this person's like too cool for school. It's like some of those people are, but a lot of them just have high standards for stuff. And it doesn't mean that their standards are correct necessarily. And this is where this comes in of you being like, oh, I was proven wrong. That's exactly right. Like I always leave a little bit of space for me to be wrong about something. Because if something's really popular, there's got to be a reason. And it can't just be that, oh, all these people are dumb that listen to it. So I would at least, doesn't mean I have to like it, but I at least want to understand why it's popular, you know, and and perhaps yes, if that's, time that seems valuable but but all i'm saying is that <laughs> i think that having those standards is great and i think like having those breakthroughs is what i live that's what i live for i like being proven wrong i like being like i think the first time i heard paramore you know i didn't grow up, i wasn't young enough to grow up with paramore during that age i guess kind of where they were targeted but that album after after laughter i think is the name of it like mm. they came and played on the late late show and i was like holy shit these guys are amazing this is like a for real pop band. Like, no, not just like we're barely able to play our instruments, you know, type of thing. Like these people wrote that shit and they're playing yeah. the shit and they produced it or they co-produced it. And so, I mean, they're very responsible for what you're seeing on stage and that's evident. And then I'm like, oh shit. Okay. That's the standard for me for pop music. You know, like I want to know that people are awake and conscious of what they're doing and that they have a message that doesn't have to be over the head. It could just be ambient or it could be literal. But it's like some kind of messaging of hopefulness or uh, something that's so badass and dark that it really gets you into your head, whatever it is. Uh, but that should be what we're looking for, or at least everybody should have their own version of that. But like to be a little bit critical is good. I think it's I think it's healthy. Yeah, it makes me remember when I was on tour with another band I was playing in and I got a text from somebody that's saying, hey, um, dude, so congrats. Like, you know, you, Kanye West sampled one of your tracks and like the album's coming out on Friday, you know, and I was sort of like in disbelief at a sound check, couldn't really understand what was happening. I find out what's happening a day later. Like I, you know, all the paperwork for the song gets signed. I'm like, this is, this is really happening. Yeah. <laughs> I finally hear the song online and I was I was so blown away. This is probably like 2015 or 16 or so, but uh-huh. this song was so 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 sick and also uplifting and positive uh message, but to hear my own song I had recorded probably 15 years ago was there was probably an influence of like, you know, Kanye's Shaka Khan like or pitched up samples is kind of what I mimicked my guitar playing after. So the whole thing was a total trip to me. Ultimately, the song never came out, but... Oh, gotcha. Mm -hmm. Yeah. People found out about it online, and all of these kids sort of like found out about who the sample was by and started making their own versions of a song with that exact sample that Kanye sampled. Mm Mm-hmm. Wow. And that's where my skepticism kind of like went, you know, it sort of raised a flag in where I'm like, there's... That's the genius of this whole thing is that this guy sort of heard something special in, you know, in anything. And it happened to be this one song of mine. Not that this is like a golden ticket to making like an incredible song, but everyone else Uh saw it as that. And there were thousands of these like versions on SoundCloud and on Spotify and stuff, just sort of copying, pasting what he had done and didn't release. And Sometimes I see that with popular things and I'm, you know, it raises my, my -hmm. flags. Yeah. Yeah. The suspicion meter. (laughs) It goes, it's off the charts sometimes for me. Yeah. We live in a a capitalistic kind of relatively corporate run music environment, you know, where we have, what do you listen to things on, you know, on, and usually people say Spotify and Spotify is, has terrible reputation right now with the way that they treat artists and most streaming platforms, really, but uh, but Spotify in particular. And it's like, okay, so you got that, or you got like some other options and titles, like a little bit more artist friendly. You know, Apple Music is whatever Apple Music is. I, I never know what that is, but it's it's there. So anytime something becomes popular, I'm always like, well, was that artificially inflated? Is that just mm-hmm. door control? You know, is that gate control? Um, is it installed? 
you know, because like certain artists, like pop artists, when they emerge, especially through the Disney system, I'm very suspicious, you know, and they could turn out to be a fine person, but it's still having gone through that. That's hard to get that, that vibe off of it. And so I'm very suspicious. I'm extra suspicious of that. I'm like, those are installed popular artists. They're given all the means to be successful. They've been trained at a young age and then they are put into the world as like these experts in psycho linguistics and, and whatever, you know? And so that's my initial thought. And sometimes there's a good song that comes out of it. And I'm like, well, I got to recognize that that's a good song. I don't, I don't necessarily appreciate how it got there, but it's there and it sounds good. Yeah. The stuff that we're all being kind of fed and prescribed and I mean, I don't even know the depths of it, but it's probably made me very sad mm. to think about. It. <laughs> yeah, all these sort of older artists that continue to tour and you think they're, you know, they're just totally set. I don't know how much you kind of do touring like per year but do you do you think you'd feel like even if you're hey like i'm good i don't need to go back on the road but you'd be compelled to just perform you know i gotta play like 30 shows a year or i'm gonna go Mm. crazy like is there a part of that for you no not at all i enjoy performing for sure but i'm not like uh i gotta workhorse this you know unless i absolutely need it if i was in debt you know or something i need to get out of debt then i do what it takes you know to do that and still make them great shows, but it's just about working hard. That's all. And I I don't have a problem with that, but I'd say in general, like, yeah, if I'm, if I'm doing okay, then I'd rather just gig smarter and, you know, just do a market and then go home, maybe do another market. But I'd also like to start creating cool events, you know, like uh, Mm. just dance events or performance events or immersive environmental events of that sort. Yeah. So I I would just figure out a way to keep doing stuff, but perhaps I change the format of it a little bit, but there'd still be live elements for sure. I'd just be thinking about like, how can you change what you're doing to suit how you want to live? And I think that that's kind of the thing I'm interested in. Yeah, I can relate to that. Or even just in the live performance thing where I'm, you know, I I have a, my band is, I think the only constant thing is that it's pretty almost entirely wordless. There's no vocal singing, but there's a guitar sort of emulating a vocal melody or that's that's how oh, people yeah, describe yeah. it and i sort of think of it like that now yeah which until you kind of get hip to it if it interests you and you hear it for the first time i'm sure that even that alone gives it some things of a what is this to somebody um you know it sounds like there's it sounds like a would be a singer doing this but it's a guitar i don't really care about guitar players at all and I've just grew up internalizing singers that that's what my band sounds like. Then I'm like, I've had, you know, it was a five piece group starting off with all, you know, a bunch of friends that we all grew up together. And then it's been a four piece with some backing tracks. And then it was a me and a drummer with entirely backing tracks because I actually thought that was like the most garage rock thing you could do in 2017 was actually just use a MacBook, which is what somebody from the 60s would have done with a silver tone Sears guitar. It's like yeah, people get caught up on the like sort of more surface level comparisons of things. And I'm like, no, it's the MacBook is like the Sears guitar and the garage. Like we all have one. And if that's how to make economic music, like that's garage rock, essentially. Like yep. it doesn't have to do with the Sonics. So all to say, I've, I've changed the band all over the years. And I like having the sort of problem to solve of like, how, to, how am I going to do this? And the last two years, I've been living half in LA, half in New York before I moved out here full time. And I had like 14 different sort of bands. Like I had a East Coast, New York City, kind of like big group. Same thing for an LA sort of bigger, like proper hometown thing. And then all of these little splinter bands to just try to pick up shows on the, in the Northeast or, mm. and it's so fun. It keeps it exciting and it keeps it like fresh. I guess I was bringing that up because it sort of like goes hand in hand with, you know, the music can change and morph. Yeah, of course. I'll take your association to music and how you make music. It's all kind of like your own culture and then the culture of others, you know, that are involved with you. And then also ourselves in each other's, you know, so 
then we create scenes. But like, I think, yeah, it's like, you know, recognizing what's important and valuable to you throughout, you know, if that's like what makes you want to do what you're doing, I think that that's, that's a good, that's a good size, a good healthy side as opposed to like mercenary. <laughs> I mean, not that that's I mean, bad. It, it's yeah, just, yeah. You know, but, but you know what I mean? Mercenary hired gun vibes where you're just like super pro. I mean, it's awesome. It's cool to be like, assassin level you know <laughs> kid like you need to be it's like michael jackson needs a guitar player you know, it's, and you're just yeah, like, yeah immediately put in there and you're like you just you're there and you just know the music and you're you know whatever certainly there is i thought there's a lot of honor in that of course but it's like it's amazing but i will say i do like having fun with friends and a good time and then getting on stage and fucking rocking out and do the best that you can you know and then have good relationship with your fans and hopefully yourself as much as you can. And then, you know, and call that groovy. And I think that's a great lifestyle. I think that's super sustainable and uh, uh, rewarding. We'll see. Yeah, I, I hope so. I feel like every artist now has to kind of go through some kind of, maybe they always have, but like pit of despair where it's like, okay, man, I got to work really hard at this and I got to post about this. And then you can really get lost in that. And it turns into this soup where sort of no matter what you're doing, nobody really wants to engage with it because it's people could just maybe feel it's not coming from a joyful just total joy place and obviously art should be you know these things that are deeply connected to emotions and you know getting other people to feel and but now there's like this sort of creator industry thing happening and it's crazy to think about too just even maybe like eight years ago or something and when somebody would be covering a guitar song in their bedroom on Instagram and it's like, let me show you how to play Sweet Child of Mine. <laughs> and it's really bad. Like it's not, doesn't sound like Slash, but the kid looks kind of cool or the camera was really good and it's, you know, 2016 and it's getting like thousands of likes. And I just remember being like, wait, that's not good. Like, I'm not trying to, you know, crap on that kid. Right, right, but right. But I'm like, I'm like, huh, like every what is everybody responding to here? Like, um, and I feel like we sort of, now we're in this other dimension of it and it's so hard to even tell you know it's like the things that are actually singular and original and really uniquely creative doesn't feel celebrated to me and i could be wrong about mm -hmm. that but i'm like it's not and that's okay it doesn't mean that it's being to actually be the most creative person is the mm -hmm. best thing it's a fair point maybe there's things in there that I don't know, we've, just, we've lost our attention span. So it's not to say things that are harder to take in are better because a lot of times maybe they're not. But, you know, it should be immediate. But there's something going on where it's just like, it's cool. You know, it's like the things that are the sort of one of a kind artists or, or you know, to me are sort of like really the underground where it's like they're not going to get assimilated into some playlist that there's other similar tones going on of and so they're just kind of like they are sort of like mercenaries in that way and it's really cool when you get to see one of those and you're like man like they're like fuck yeah 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 for sure for sure like my friend tosin abasi you know he's like playing his prog metal you know and you're watching these like just insane lines using crazy techniques you know like self-invented you know grab techniques like whatever <laughs> and like and then also customizing a guitar and you know all this stuff but then you're you know it's like listening to king crimson or something like that you're there's this kind of assassin level musicianship but the music is so badass it comes from a very strong vision and that i enjoy that I enjoy because the creativity is evident. The, the music is creative. It's like, you don't really have to worry, you know, like no, who, who's making that for like, other than for people who like that, you know, you know what I mean? It's like, that's the kind of music you like to make. That's just, that's definitely, it's a pretty honest music form. Yeah. Are there some egos involved that want to, you know, be a part of that glory, you know, tier or whatever? Yes, of course. But even that's good because it's like, it's inspiring people to, try to do that you know but yeah but i agree with you like we get fed a lot of corporate algorithmic music and some artists are kind of the human real world version of that you know and and not to say that that's necessarily bad it's just a symptom of capitalism capitalism in art art and meeting capitalism the capitalist part is always going to want to take over the market it's just the nature of it it's just what it is but it does keep sincere, cool stuff extra cool. 
Yeah, that's a good way to look at it. You know, it's just like what you were saying when you like when you encounter something, you know, that you weren't expecting to dig or you thought like it was played out or whatever it is. And then suddenly you're like, oh, shit. Oh, my God, that's great. You know, and, and you're like, I thought like the first time I saw Turnstile, I was like, who are these hot, no shirt wearing kind of Jane's addiction? -y, you know, what's going on? You know, like, what is this shit? And then seeing them live, I was like, oh, fuck, these guys are for real. They're like, this is some sincere shit. You can't fucking make that shit up. Yeah. And I mean, it, it was made up, but it was made up. But, was, yeah. <laughs> but, but uh, yeah, you know, like, and then, and then I'm like, okay, that's great. But the, anyways, that my point is like, I think that there's, you, you can't, there is no substitute for sincerity. So you can do things that look close to it, that feel close to it. But ultimately I think human beings are too nuanced. Like that wiring is so deep and so primal and so old I don't think you can get that. You, you can you can get rid of that. I did this like interview with a guitar guy recently. I grew up as you know sixteen year old assassin level, like you know in, locked in my bedroom playing all the tunes. And then there was sort of a light switch moment for my my band, kind of like creating it where it's you know a vocal is like three notes, and so mm. it's the opposite of that. So everyone, I guess, maybe associates like that with my sound and what people like about it in the terms of that guitar playing wise, it's refreshing because it's not a bunch of notes. And so the guy was asking me like, you know, how to, how to, our advice or something like that, uh, you know, cause he's trying to play more lyrically or simply and it wasn't working. And it just sort of like uh, hit me in that way that you talk about the sincerity thing. It's like, uh, well, maybe that's just not what you do like, or like, you know, mm -hmm. you can't, it's only going to work if that's really, like, I, I connected with something of just like, you know, growing up with an MP3 player and listening to my favorite artists and really just the vocal being fully internalized and the lyrics and the way that they sing it. And if, you know, if it was produced so that they were, you know, really whispering into a microphone or singing really loud and the different emotions that that can make you feel. And so my guitar playing is, you know, inspired by that, which is really just sincerely what I grew up listening to and liking. So mm -hmm. I think I, mm -hmm. I think the sincerity thing, it's like, yeah, people aren't, it's a pretty esoteric band and concept. And I don't really think that in general, that's the thing that everyone's gravitating to. But it's like behind that where you can't really see it is that there is a sincerity there that maybe is resonating with people. And it's fun to even just talk about the thing that's behind the thing, because we're mm -hmm. so conditioned right now to just sort of see the what the thing looks like yeah is it acceptable the way it looks on its face did they do a good job presenting it exactly yeah yeah 100 percent. i mean and but the you know the thing is i think what's great about people that are a little bit more conscious like being in the popular space is it presents a problem for corporate based art because because it is sincere and it's so good at what it does that they can't mimic it and it threatens their market share and so it's it's interesting to see that happen. And also, sometimes it's kind of nice to see them give up and go like, yeah, this is really good. There's nothing we can do about it. You know, and, and that's kind of a win, you know, for creativity and, and sincerity. You know, it's like when Nirvana came on the scene. That's what I was thinking about when you were talking about this. Nirvana, it's like, yeah, that's a great example. You know, um, it was like, yeah, sure. You had, you had bands like No Doubt, you know, things of that nature. That super badass band, for sure. But Nirvana was like something else. It was an evolution of rock and roll that was very distinctive and uh, wholly themselves and partially regional. So when things like that come on the scene, or Bjork or uh, Missy Elliott. My reference more stop with those things anyway. I'm like, Busta Rhymes. I'm like, I am only can think in terms yes. of early 90s and 2000s. I've yeah, I know. I know. About, so. Well, because it's, it's hard. I mean, I honestly thought Keen was going to be that. Because I like Keen, it sounds crazy, but when Keen first came on the scene, I was so down with that. I was like this kind of cro like like neo crooner indie rock, you know, kind of thing. And with like really, really considered and thoughtful songwriting, mm -hmm. you know, and this vocalist that I loved his voice. That was so great. When I saw their video with him on stage and the kind of like big leather jacket and he had like the foppish blonde hair and I was like, 
what a strange man to be singing this way and, <laughs> and, and or, or whatever. And then I heard that I was like, oh, that's, that's going to potentially bring in a, you know, perhaps an era of blah, blah, blah. It's kind of cold playish, whatever. Right. And then nothing happened. And then, and that's fine too. Right. Like that, you know, right. there's the, can be the promise of something. <laughs> that's cool. But, but yeah, anyways, but to go back, like, yeah, like Nirvana, something like Nirvana coming on the scene, you're like, they, you know, and they're all scrambling. So I remember all that. I was in Seattle at that time. And I remember all the labels scrambling and setting up satellite offices and like, who's going to be the next Nirvana or the next Pearl Jam? And there was no next Soundgarden because no one is ever going to be Soundgarden, no matter how hard they try. But, you know, there's like this rush to like, we need to find the gold. Where is it? We need more of this shit. Everclear. Let's sign them for $27 million or whatever the fuck <laughs> they they got and then barely produced anything. Right. But But all of that to say there are a lot of forces at work for things to exist in the world. And it is nice when things get through and things are so undeniable, like, like no one was going to stop Prince. Like Prince was going, it was, is an inevitability. Like it was just must've been so different or I love that, you know, this imagining him kind of coming out on the scene, like so strong to yeah. Prince, yeah. you know? Yeah. Or, you know, Aretha Franklin or someone like that. It's like you, you know, even more so. Aretha Franklin is respected and loved. I, anybody who doesn't, who wouldn't have liked some of her biggest hits, like Respect or something like that, is either it's it's like they really aren't connecting, like they definitely, sincerely do not connect with that music. Like they they find it okay, but it's not really theirs. I'd say that's probably a pretty small sliver because like that music is so infectious. You know, if you're around a bunch of people that love that song. And you're hearing that song and you were kind of mid about that song before I, I'm pretty sure you would, your levels would rise a bit. Bump it up. Yeah, exactly. You know, cause it's a little, it's a little undeniable when someone's singing that incredibly with that much power and that much ease, simultaneous ease, power, character, and style with like incredible instrumentation and production. I mean, you're fucked, man. That's like undeniable juggernaut stuff. And that once in a while, that shit exists. You know, Whitney Houston, you know, <laughs> you know, Janet Jackson's Control album, you know, uh, that type of shit or Elbow yeah, that's cool. or, you know, whatever, you know, yeah, Massive Attack. Thank you, Reggie. Yeah. Thank you so much, Steve. It was, it was awesome. Very cool. I'll be looking out for you on these mean streets. Sliver leg. Okay. Thanks for listening to the Talk House Podcast, and thanks to Steve Marion and Reggie Watts for chatting. If you liked what you heard, please give us a review on your favorite podcasting platform, and make sure you check out all the great stuff at TalkHouse.com. This episode was produced by Myron Kaplan, and the Talk House theme is composed and performed by The Range. See you next time.